Been a while since I did a video, a proper one I mean, I wouldn't count the April 1st scrap I made. Anyway, here we are at the letter Q. It's fine for now. I have a couple creatures to choose from, but the longer this series goes on, well, I'll likely have to scrape the bottom of the barrel later on. I chose the Questing Beast or Best Glatizan for this video, which not only has an interesting look, but is quite intriguing overall. It is a monster from Arthurian Legends, and as such, there are a few versions of it, with occasionally nothing but its namesake being shared between them. The older image of the beast is quite vague. It is described in the Persevalus. Persevalu? I think it's French. As white as new fallen snow, bigger than a hare, but smaller than a fox. Not much to go on, but there is an interesting feature attached. The creature bears 12 of her children within, which bark like a pack of dogs tormenting her existence. To make things worse, it's not just the unceasing yelps. If they are old enough to be born, the offspring tear the questing beast apart from the inside. What a horrific idea. I would say were there no examples of this in nature, it's so common it has a name. Metrophagy. Have fun reading up on it. That being said, it would be a unique case for mammals. In the post vulgate version of these legends, the questing beast is only described as big and strange. It was the prose Tristan that provided an actual portrayal of the monster. It is said to have the head and neck of a serpent, the body of a leopard, the hindquarters of a lion, and the feet of a stag. Looking at it, some of you might have already guessed what the inspiration likely was for it. It seems like a misconception of what a giraffe is, similar to a camelopard. However, this monster has some unique features to differentiate it, as well as a disturbing origin story. The barking of 20, 30 or occasionally 40 pairs of hounds from its belly is quite consistent, but in later editions, it is also said to be tormented by an unquenchable thirst. It searches for bodies of water to combat this unceasing affliction. It drinks without satisfaction, the suffering unaffected by the very act it compels the beast to commit. Yet. Whenever its lips touch the pristine surface of any pond, a lake or river, poisonous saliva leaks tainting the water, forcing the beast to move on perpetually. A cruel fate, one the creature does not deserve, although this could be another link between the best glutton and giraffes, as the posture in which the latter drinks is quite a sight to behold. It likely inspired many a European traveler. According to the legends, there is only one such monster, but how did it come to be? The Arthurian way, with a good bit of incest. However, there are a few variations with this as well, but one thing is consistent, the participation of royal brother and sister. In one version, they just do their naughty business and that's it, they conceive a giraffe. In others, it is a lot more complicated. It begins with the sister lusting for her own brother, just like in your average Japanese fiction. However, the guy refuses her attempts to seduce him, so as the logical next step, she goes to see a therapist. Of course, that's not what happens. She conspires with the devil instead. Depending on the teller of the story, her goal is either to have him murdered or make him fall in love. The devil only asks a quick one in return. That's how the questing beast is conceived, but that's not all of the story. So, either as part of the plan or due to the manipulations of said infernal participant, she accuses her brother with rape. Their dad is pretty pissed about it and has the boy torn apart by hounds. As the poor sibling dies, he prophesizes that the child will be a monster, who will make the same sound as the dogs who are about to lacerate him. This is one of the origins of its sound, but there's more to it. Glatizon in French and Middle English means parking, but the questing beast variant is far more interesting. In Middle English, question means both to bark and to hunt, and as it happens, the monster is extensively quested after. Sir Pelinor is the first to go after it, chasing it all his life, but to no avail. It is Sir Palamedes who has a stronger link to it in most stories. He is the one to finally catch it after losing all 11 of his brothers to the hunt. When the questing beast dies, it retreats into a deep lake which spews out flames and continues to boil even after the creature's death. Poor thing. She is not only tormented by an unquenchable thirst throughout her life, but pursued by a band of knights, killed for no reason. 
Well, she is not killed in some modern versions, but that's beside the point. As for the rest of the Arthurian legends, the beast appears seemingly at random, with no clear meaning. The titular king sees the monster after having put Mordred into his half-sister. It can symbolize incest, anarchy, foretell a future fall, Christ, unsurprisingly, everything seems to symbolize him, faithful Christians, the duality of Sir Palmides, the Saracen Knight, or the meaning is simply for the reader to decide. Most people are pretty torn on what it is actually meant to represent, and since I'm not an art critic, <laughs> well, not of centuries old art anyway, I'm not going to draw a conclusion. I'm a lot more interested in the descriptions rather than the subtext. Anyway, there are a few more tidbits worth sharing. In one of my books I read that it is supposed to have iron-like scales and ooze a prodigious amount of slime, however, I found no other account of this, so take it with a pinch of salt. What is definitely totally completely true though is that the questing beast has a physical representation in the world. Well, kinda. In the Republic of Molossia, a micronation that is not recognized officially, there is a stone called Helicopter Rock. According to Molossia's very own website, as King Pelinor was able to draw near the beast in Molossia, it leaped away mightily, leaving its print in the surface of Helicopter Rock, where the mark can be seen to this day. The quest then doubtless continued and today, only the mysterious mark in the rock is evidence of Molossia's brush with Arthurian legend. Yeah, it is definitely a fabrication as I do not see how the quest has led Pelinor to North America and being called Helicopter Rock seems to indicate that it has had a run-in with such contraption before the questing beast thing was ever made up, but I digress. It's a neat little idea, albeit completely devoid of any real connection to the Arthurian legends. With all this said, the only thing left for me is to devise a realistic version of the best god is on. Now, I'm not going to take the easy route and say it's a giraffe. It is, but that would make this part of the deal rather boring. What I'd like to see is whether it's possible to make it a reptile, hooves and all. Naturally, one would start this investigation by taking a look at sauropod dinosaurs. This clade includes well-known animals like the Diplodocus or Apatosaurus. Characteristically, these creatures were extremely large, with long necks and tails, as well as pillar-like limbs. Now, apart from the long necks, there is not that much in common between one of these dinos and giraffes, and after all we do aim to make a reptilian version of those. However, there is a family that has features more aligned with the image of the questing beast, Brachiosauridae. Unlike most sauropods, their front limbs are longer than their hind legs, the neck is more prominently held upright, and their tails are a bit shorter. Now, we still have a huge journey to take, but these animals are a fine start, so let's see what's missing and attempt to solve these problems. First off, the size is both incompatible and extremely unlikely. An average Brachiosaurus is estimated to weigh around 30 tons, measure lengths of about 20 meters, with a height of approximately 9 meters. If we look at the image that depicts King Arthur with the best glottisan, we can see that would be a bit of an overkill. It's seemingly the size of a, well, giraffe. However, we needn't worry. Dwarf sauropods actually used to be a thing. One of these was the Magyarosaurus. Oh god, Hungarians are shit at naming things. These animals were around 6 meters in length, which means about a 4 meter height with a raised head. That is actually smaller than an average giraffe which range from a little over 4 meters to a bit under 6. If we were to make up a dwarf Brachiosaurus, that would both give us a direct ancestor for our questing beast, as well as a reason this particular species might have survived the Cretaceous Pelagene extinction event. Would it be as large as your regular sauropod? There would be no way you could survive such an event, but after being downsized significantly, it could stand a chance. However, it still has some evolving to do. Now, obviously, mammals did not evolve from sauropods. In fact, they diverged from early reptiles way before those were even a thing. However, I would again bring up the phenomenon of convergent evolution. I briefly touched upon this in an earlier video, but the gist of it is that animals tend to develop similar solutions to the same problem. In the case of this beast with the changing world, it would be in its best interest to lose some weight 
but retain its height that would give it an advantage against other herbivores. Yes, it is a herbivore, a meat eater would make no real sense. As well as a prominent tool against lesser predators. A shape similar to giraffe with narrower limbs and a smaller tail are not unlikely outcomes. Neither are hooves. This may be a stretch, as we simply cannot have any such example where a reptile-like creature has hooves. However, like synopsids came to evolve into modern mammals, including those with hooves, it is not an impossibility for a creature with scaly origins. I'd argue that sauropods turning mammal-like would have been a likely development were they still alive today. Sure, these beats would not be true mammals, like whales are not fish, despite the similarities, but they don't have to be. Why would they evolve hooves though? Well, with narrower limbs, a bit of extra surface to stand on would likely help them in the often treacherous grounds of the British Isles. Hair would also be nice against the fable grey weather of the area, protecting it against the relative cold with little need for a thick winter coat. It's looking nice, practically all features of the questing beast are well represented here. Well, appearance-wise anyway, we still have two significant requirements. First, the sound, not really a tough one. In fact, for mammals or birds, practically any sound is within the realm of possibilities, and for our made-up quasi-synapsid, it would likely be no issue to bark. What's more, we could say that this particular bark sounds like several animals at once. Not only would that make the creature unique, but it is an interesting defense mechanism. If you cannot see the beast, only hear it, you might think there is a large pack of hounds yapping, likely dissuading many predators unaccustomed to the sound. On the other hand, the unquenchable thirst and poisonous drinking habits are a bit tougher to explain. The thirst can mostly be hand-waved, pulling out the likely origin of this aspect in the real world as the answer. The unusual drinking method of the giraffe, alright, but what about the noxious saliva? There is little reason for herbivore to have poison glands in its mouth, as it is not likely to bite anything beside leaves. However, there could be a less deadly version. Let's say the questing beasts mark their territory using saliva, not piss. Beside being marginal more elegant, this could mean that their drool is quite nasty, thick, pungent, with a tendency to float on top of the water like some sickly foam. With embellishments, this would easily turn into such a legend. Who would want to drink that, after all? Also, this is quite a nice segue to my last point. They would be mostly solitary animals. The legend says there is only one, which is extremely elusive. Naturally, no animal species can exist with but a single specimen. Not for a long time, anyway. So there'd bound to be more. Despite their size, the questing beasts would likely be very reclusive, only found in larger groups during mating season and while rearing their offspring. Such a behavior would necessitate an effective way to mark territory, hence their foul spittle. To draw a few more parallels, okapi, which are closely related to giraffes, are extremely good at hiding despite the fact that they are not exactly small. They were so proficient at it that westerners thought okapi were a legend until the 20th century. Naturally, the questing beast wouldn't be as skilled due to its larger stature, but the existence of the legends assures us that this still fits within our fictional lore. With all this addressed, I must say this made-up animal is one of the more far-fetched ones, like the griffin, as its existence requires far more alterations in our natural history. Still, I think it's neat. Again, I apologize for the longer than expected hiatus, I'm juggling with a lot of stuff and my life is kinda all over the place right now, and the April 1st video slowed things down a bit. I should be more consistent for the foreseeable future, so I hope to see you then. Bye!